Hello, in this session, I'm going to consider just what kind of leadership is required to enable change on complex, ambiguous and uncertain environments. And this is a question of leadership strategy. How can we exercise leadership across multiple organisations, stakeholders, communities and citizens, and move beyond individual professional disciplines within and across a range of organisations and stakeholder cultures, often where we have no formal authority or direct managerial control. And what kind of leadership interventions are possible when we know that we cannot predict their outcome and there may be unintended consequences? To answer these questions, let's explore the very contemporary notion of systems leadership. As you can see from Van Dyke, Liechtenstein and Ham, there is no widely agreed definition of systems leadership. And these definitions recognise that many social challenges are too complex to be solved by a single leader or a single organisation with formal authority. The system is defined by complex interactions, as no single person knows the answer to these problems. And this is where complexity theory comes in. Many problems facing public organisations can be considered to be simple, being clearly definable and having tried and tested solutions. And these solutions are right or wrong, and it's clear when the problem has been solved. Head and Alford call these a stopping rule. And such tame problems do not require systems leadership. However, other problems, such as climate change, are ill-defined, and there's no agreement as to what factors are involved in the problem. And most importantly, there is no ultimate end to the problem, so that it needs to be resolved as contexts change. It was the two urban planners, Rittle and Weber, who coined the term wicked problems over 40 years ago to describe the management and leadership challenges posed by the nature of such problems. So let's consider there to be three types of systems. Simple systems, the domain of the known knowns, and the approach here is one of accessing the facts and categorising them and basing responses on established practice. There are complicated systems, no one right way of doing things, and the approach here is one of assessing the facts and applying knowledge and judgement to them, responding on the basis of good practice. And then there are complex systems, where we can only observe cause and effect in retrospect. With complex systems, there are often complex problems, and we can classify these as critical problems that require commanders, and a commander's role is to take required decisive action, where they can legitimise coercion as a necessary place for the public good. There are tame problems which require management, where the manager's role is to use appropriate processes to solve the tame problem. We can be very clear whether the problem has been solved or not. And finally, wicked problems, which require leadership. There's no known solution. And these problems are either novel, keeping reoccurring, and may have no clear definition of success. What might be better to articulate the domain of today's strategic leader is that leadership is hard and is likely to get harder. Our focus within this course is the domain of strategic leadership and it's essential that we consider exactly what is meant by the term strategic because our first challenge is to consider that strategic is often an overused and frequently misunderstood term in management science and practice. Here, we are primarily concerned with the long term. The assessments, the decisions, the actions that lead to the long term success and sustainability of the organisation. Simply put, the difference between being able to survive and being able to thrive. The ability to put into action the ideas that will outlive management and leadership teams and will ensure that obtaining a level of competitive advantage is both realistic and achievable. Straightforward? Yes. Achievable? Well, actually, that depends. And let's be clear about something straight away. Not all leaders achieve strategic success, and not all leaders are able to bring their organisations and their teams forward, whereby challenges are faced with great dexterity and change is a topic of great comfort. But if we're honest, nobody expects every strategic leader to be able to do this. It simply isn't realistic, and the numbers don't lie. What we can and should expect is that we can benefit from understanding the science behind the numbers 
and can learn from the top 5% of strategic leaders who achieve all of these things and more. So let's think about the numbers for a moment. The COVID-19 pandemic, for all of the human horrors that it has brought, has underlined once again just how good a crisis is for showing us how bad we are at dealing with change. But we are at the threshold of some of the greatest changes ever seen in business history. From 1500s to the 1800s, the expansion in international trade during this time was immense and we saw that organisations had the right to critical trading routes and they began to organise themselves more effectively. Dominant forces at this time included the Dutch and the British East India trading companies. When we move to the 1700s through to the 1900s, we see companies embracing the opportunities provided by mechanisation, cost reduction and the integration of other allied activities such as finance and insurance. When we look at the Industrial Revolution, the acceleration in the development of production techniques, the speed of manufacturing and communication and advanced management methods, we think about professional managers for the first time, marketing, advertising and other innovations. From the 1920s onwards, the professional manager enabled businesses to expand for the use of quasi-scientific management systems. And management teams have become greatly incentivized to deliver value to shareholders. And in some ways, this development of the world of leadership and management continued in a relatively linear fashion for 500 years or so. What is concerning is that the pace of change is accelerating rapidly and generally speaking our collective ability to perform at the highest level strategically has not kept up pace with the level of change. The pandemic has accelerated the digitization of customer and supply chain interactions, delivering projects that would have ordinarily taken four years in three to six months. And this is great news, isn't it? Industries finally get their way from playing catch-up and can be more effective and capitalise on the post-pandemic opportunities that are likely to come their way. To attempt a poor piece of Shakespearean robbery, some can change, some have change thrust upon them, but not all can make change a success. No matter what happens, the vast amount of change initiatives fail, over 70% and rising, and this is a startling number. Despite the resources, the time, the energy, seven out of ten change initiatives do not work. And worse still, they can cost a lot of money, and at worst they can be fatal. And the main reason for all of these failures is poor leadership decisions. And I'd like to put to you some examples of poor leadership decisions, and then we will consider how to adopt the mindset of the top 5%. After all, we can learn from failure, and we can learn to replicate the successful approaches of others as well. Firstly, not involving the right people. And this is a fundamental cause of failure to deliver change successfully. Change must occur throughout the organisation. It cannot operate in isolation. And neither can we expect the organisation to exist as per the outdated beliefs that people work for the good of the organisation that shareholder value is paramount and this is a world wherein there exists perfect information and perfect understanding of said information. We can forget bottom or top-down initiatives. A failure to understand the impact that change has on everyone affected by an initiative, what it means to their careers, their opportunities, their customers and lives, will mean at best there will be pockets of resistance that exist and grow and at worst, overt policies of organisational-wide resistance or covert policies of apathy and passive working. If we don't involve everyone who is impacted on by the change initiative from the outset and understand their individual and collective concerns and identify the key people, those people who can influence others and understand where you can help them, there will be a major issue. Do not go it alone. Another issue is not creating a compelling case for change. It's amazing and I never cease to be surprised that so many strategic leaders offer no compelling case for urgent change. In fact, a compelling case should be made, updated and continually presented to all stakeholders. And people may not thank you for it straight away, but they will destroy initiatives if they feel threatened or marginalised. When people don't understand why change is necessary, 
how it will help them or benefit the organisation. It can lead to a level of anxiety, cynicism, anger and resistance. And even with a solid intellectual rationale for change, people inevitably want to understand the implications for them and how it impacts. Another mistake is not modifying behaviour. The standard operating procedures may have to change in order for change to become truly effective. If that doesn't change in necessary ways, then all the work to change strategy, structure and systems is likely to come to nothing. Culture is, however, hard to work on directly, and it can only be changed by altering people's behaviours. And the first step is to clearly define what behaviours are necessary for driving a transformation. The next is to figure out what levers are available to alter them. We cannot adapt in the face of issues. That's another big problem. And many change initiatives don't work out as planned, but take very unexpected turns. And this especially applies to complex change endeavours with many different variables. And whilst it still pays off having an implementation plan and a schedule on hand, it is equally important to update it based on how things evolve over time. Ignoring politics is a major problem. Depending on how well you manage it, organisational politics can be a cure or a blessing. And there's just one thing for sure, your change initiative will be part of the game and thus you need to have politics and power on the radar. As I mentioned earlier, organisations are very much about resources, priorities and power. Your change initiative can only succeed when you use your political skills to take part in this competition. And I'll argue that strategic leaders need to be unbounded along three select dimensions. They must be able to spot or foresee all opportunities. They must be able to guide their firm towards a desired course of action. And finally, they must be able to legitimise a given course of action in the eyes of relevant external stakeholders. The presence of limitations along any of these dimensions leaves opportunities on the table. Now, our focus here is on limitations in the management of mental processes, which are central to preserving uncontested superior positions in settings where competition is intense. The deeper the limitations that need to be counted in order to pursue a given opportunity, the more likely it is that this opportunity is uncontested. Thus existing superior opportunities tend to be those that reflect especially acute limitations. In times of crisis, being close to the issue creates a critical sense of urgency, focusing our attention and galvanising us into action. A crisis is galvanising, yet it's a state of mind that is unsustainable.